I actually have an email that was sent to me by Mike Sempervivi. You probably best know him as the host of the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. You might know him best that way, but I know him as a longtime wrestling correspondent. A journalist, even. MidAtlanticPod.com are available wherever you find your favorite podcast. But here's his email. I thought this was interesting. So let me get your uh, opinion or take or views or whatever you want to add to this. All right. Which hopefully will be better than what I'm doing before yeah, right here. It couldn't possibly be any worse, so go ahead. This was sent on the 20th. So as we're recording, it was sent to me a week ago. Just let me clarify the time. This past week marks the 35th anniversary of the Midnight Express's debut in the traditional end of Jim Crockett Promotions, appearing on the TV tapings in Greenville and Shelby, August 12th and 13th. After coming from Dallas, where you worked many small towns, which were often on their ass, and almost always against the Fantastics, did you get a feeling of deja vu coming to Georgia? and working small towns such as Blackshear or Jasper, <laughs> which were often on their ass, <laughs> and almost exclusively with the Sawyers, who couldn't have been as easy to work with as Tommy and Bobby, the Fantastics. Oh, um, I, I know, I know, well, I know he has other questions, because <clears throat> you prepped me on the, on the email on this one, but I want to address it because we'll get confusing, and, and it'll, people will lose track of the first question. Um, we had just come from Dallas, and the reason why we went to Atlanta instead of going to Charlotte was because when Vince had taken over the TBS time slot in 1984, there had been such a backlash from the fans. We, you know, where's Gordon Soley? We want our fucking NWA wrestling. What the fuck is this? It was it was a complete style mismatch, and and people didn't get it. WWF wrestling suddenly on TBS. So. Turner hedged a little bit by giving Ole Anderson, who had been, obviously, Ole was at that time the owner of Georgia Championship, the majority owner of, uh, or he had been, until fucking Vince took it out from under him. He'd been running the Georgia office. So Ole got an early morning time slot, I think 7.30, wasn't it, on Saturday mornings for an hour of championship wrestling from Georgia. And... He had brought in a lot of talent. Lawler came down and worked a lot of talent from Memphis because that was the territory right up on top of him and, and other, you know, NWA territories, Southern territories, sent some guys. And finally, after what, close to a year or so, not even maybe, um, Crockett made the deal with Vince. Vince needed to finance the first WrestleMania. Crockett gave him a million dollars for the TBS time slot. And Vince... Brokered by quote, Jim Barnett. Brokered by Jim Barnett. And Vince took that money and financed the first WrestleMania, and Crockett had the national TV. Which, And then there's a side story in that that Turner had promised Bill Watts because Mid-South Wrestling, but then also he put on TBS on Sunday afternoons, it was getting better ratings than everything. And he was going to go into business with Watts, but when Crockett came calling, he reneged on the deal with Watts, or we could have seen Watts fighting Vince, which would have been... Actually, probably hella interesting. But anyway, when you say better ratings than everything, not just everything in wrestling, it was the highest rated show on cable television. Yeah. Mid-South Wrestling for what, three or four months there that run on Sunday afternoons was the highest rated show on cable television. Anyway, when Crockett took over TBS, Ole still had a show and still had an office. They had an office in Atlanta. They had towns booked, building contracts. So I don't know all the financial and paperwork, uh, you know, arrangements, but Ole was welcomed because Ole had been Booker and top star for Jim Crockett for the previous, you know, fucking 20 years. So Ole was welcomed back into the fold and they were going to try to run the Atlanta office with all, with the TV contracts they had um, in, in Georgia and, and, you know, the, the, the buildings they had booked, they also, Georgia had been the first ones to do the Northern tours off of TBS. So Georgia back in 81, it started going to Ohio, West Virginia and Michigan, the Sheik's territory that he had let, let languish after he'd gone out of business. And the Georgia office had been doing better business there for a few years than they were in Georgia. And then that 
went downhill too when the TV was taken off and the, the television was screwed up and blah, blah, blah. So the point is, you had the Charlotte end of the territory that was the traditional uh, uh, schedule, and then you had a crew of guys in Georgia fulfilling those dates and the arenas that had been booked and et cetera, and Georgia was on its ass. And that's where they moved us to because Dusty didn't want to bring us right into Charlotte because he had established the Rock and Roll Express in July, they came in and beat the Russians for the world tag title their first night on television. And he wanted to keep the rock and roll and the midnight apart for six months so that he could build the midnight separately. So he thought, well, it'd be a good idea. We'll put them in Georgia. We'll let them get over down there. They'll be on TBS. And then we'll start bringing them to the syndicated televisions that we do in the Carolinas. And by the end of the year, we'll fold both territories together and they'll be up here and then we pull the trigger on the express angle. <clears throat> well, the only optimistic part of that was they thought that the Atlanta end could limp along for six more months and it couldn't. Um, Mike's question coming from Dallas where we worked many small towns, which were often on their ass. That's actually not particularly accurate. The towns in Dallas, even then in 85, after the boom period had started to settle down, that were on their ass were all the towns in South Texas. The old uh, San Antonio Territory towns that they were trying to run, Corpus Christi, Laredo, um, my God, Harlingen, right down there on the border, and these spot shows. We've talked about um, that one time we were <laughs> at a spot show in South Texas, like 30 miles from the Mexican border in a tin shed in a mud field with a sign on the front of it on a sheet and spray painted wrestling tonight right <clears throat> those towns were shitty um and west texas was not doing real good because that had been traditionally the 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 funk territory and and you know they had taken it over and it did okay with the von erics and the Freebirds, but when that cooled off they didn't keep track of West Texas. Like the Guerrero still promoted El Paso, and that was a real good town, but Amarillo and Lubbock, Nick Roberts was at that time not exactly a fireball promoter, and oftentimes you would see him sleeping in the ring trailer. So, But the small towns around the Dallas area were fucking incredible. You know, you'd go to, to a, I remember one time, Grand Prairie, Texas was in the Metroplex, literally 10 miles from our apartment. We did $16,000. That was 2000 people at those ticket prices. Um, anything in the Dallas Metroplex was cooking and anything out of it wasn't. So unfortunately, when we moved to Georgia, nothing was cooking. The Omni got everybody. They got all the Crockett guys and everything, but the Georgia towns just got <laughs> Me, you know, the Midnight Express, Buzz and Brett Sawyer were a top heel team. Pez Watley, um, uh, the Italian Stallion, all the guys that they were given. Ray Candy, I think, was still. No, it was the last time I was in Georgia. Ray Candy was still there. Anyway, it was that those towns were rotten. And it was our job to work with Buzz and Brett Sawyer every night in these, in these shows because they were to put us over and establish us as a top heel team. And Brett Sawyer was fine. He, you know, he was an okay worker and an okay guy and, you know, nothing wrong with him. Buzz was a tremendous worker when he wanted to be in a complete mental case, a fucking drug addict and a prick. And he knew that they were finishing him up because it, Dusty was finishing him up and going to move him out. And as a matter of fact, Dick Slater was there also. Slater was the booker in Atlanta and he knew that he was about to be moved out. He'd already been superseded by Dusty being the booker of everything. And now he knew they were about to move him out and he was fixed to go to mid South. So he wasn't real fucking pleased either. And he took buzz with him and he took buzz with him and thank and not, and actually buzz no showed ended up. I think they left a couple weeks early because they didn't want to, he buzz didn't Brett didn't care. Buzz didn't want to do the fucking jobs. And buzz was still thinking it was three years before when he was the top heel in Georgia. And it wasn't. And there was this one night, and was, I've told this story before, but it's been a while, and it's Rodeo Arena in somewhere in suburban Atlanta. I can't remember goddamn what the town was, but it was literally where they had rodeos and a building where they had rodeos and cattle shows. And at the time, um, 
Dusty had had a meeting with all the talent. As a matter of fact, that that goes into the second part of the email, which I have now pulled up in front of me, so I'll I'll help you with. Uh, After that first question, uh, Mike continued, you knew how exciting the North End was getting. Actually, it was the East End, Charlotte's East of Atlanta. But did you ever do any second guessing, especially in the two weeks before Dusty met with you at TBS Studios on July 13th to basically give you a vote of confidence and to reiterate that the team always goes over no matter of the match or situation? Actually, Dusty didn't meet with us to do that specifically. He called one of his meetings at TBS for the entire roster and he would let them know things that were going on that they needed to know. And one of them, he said, I want to welcome the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette. They're coming in. They're going to be a top heel team. I want to let everybody know from this point on, they're going over. No matter where it is, they're going over. They're going over till I stay different. They're going to win everything. Because <laughs> he wanted all the boys to know, right? Well, it wasn't long after this meeting. We're at this rodeo building. And fucking Buzz is selling so he can give Brett the tag because Buzz didn't want to do the job, so Brett do the job. Buzz had to sell. So Bobby Eaton brings Buzz over to the ropes, and he's choking him over the rope, and Bobby gives me the Iggy, and he takes the referee. So I come over, and I give Buzz a shot to the neck with the racket. Boom. Well, and they work for him another minute, and then they come over, and then Bobby's got Buzz on the ropes again. And it's the same fucking thing. And as he backs up, I'm going to go take another little poke to get some heat. And Buzz out of nowhere. Oh, and also Dusty in the meeting said, and nobody touches Jim Cornette until I say so. Because he didn't want anybody taking the heat off of me. I think he was probably talking to Buzz Sawyer at this time. As I go up to give Buzz another poke, Buzz comes from I don't know where the fuck with his right hand and slaps me, but he didn't slap me in the cheek. He slapped me in the flat of the face right on my nose because I didn't know it was coming, so I didn't feed him for it. He just took the whack. Fuck, nose starts bleeding. I'm like, motherfucker. And I fucking got hot, and Bobby gets back on top of him. He's choking him. He's like, you're not supposed to touch Corny. I'm like, fucking, I don't care. I took that racket and bent it sideways and whacked that fucking dog-faced motherfucker about four times right across the goddamn fucking forehead with it, sideways with the frame. And he got hot, and now he's trying to crawl out from under Bobby Eaton to come out there. Well, you hitting me like a mark. I said, you just hit me like you're a mark. So anyway. Um, they finished the fucking match and we go back in the heel trailer. We're dressing in trailers. I mean, like uh, uh, not to Winnebago trailers, not like giant trailer trailers. And we go back in now. What the fuck's with his fucking, you know, what's his problem? Right. And fucking Bobby and Dennison with the referee. I think Mike fever. I think it was, we're the only ones in there. All of a sudden we hear this Rrr! and there was a wooden box that they put next to this Winnebago that you stepped up on and then opened the door and come in. You've, you've been in a Winnebago, right? Here comes Buzz Sawyer. He clomps up on that box and he fucking opens the door and pulls the door off the Winnebago, the screen door, not the big one. And he's, what are you fucking hitting me like a mark for? I said, what are you fucking hitting me like a mark for? Right now it's Buzz Sawyer and there's four of us. But he's crazy, so Dennis has got his hand in his bag just in case, because if Buzz Sawyer decides to make a further issue out of this, he's going to get shot between the eyes. We normally reserve that fucking, uh, for the fans that were chasing us down the highway, but this is a different situation. So anyway, he screams and yells and slobbers a little bit and fucking leaves, and when he goes out, he's already torn, he tore the goddamn screen door off the hinge right so it's hanging and as he goes out he grabs the door to steady himself walking down and the door completely comes off so he misses the step and falls over the goddamn box and fucking and then he throws the box and he walks off and i think that was the night that he the next day he just said fucking he left two weeks early didn't Um, you ever run in with slater as the booker too well yes that was the week before in ohio I think that's another thing that that, uh, called this meeting because we had gotten on the Ohio tour and Dusty had already told us we were supposed to go over, blah, 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 right? We got on the Ohio tour and I can't remember, I'd have to get my book out, but it was like, you know, we're in Columbus and then, you know, uh, 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 
not Accra, Canton, Canton Civic Center, and uh, like Wheeling, West Virginia, that type of mid-level market tours that they were doing up there. And we worked with Slater and Buzz one night and go 30 minutes Broadway in the main event. And it wasn't that fucking great. And so the next day, you know, Bobby and Dennis said, well, maybe you better find out, Corny. So the next day I called the office in Charlotte, not to stooge, but just to relay the information we're supposed to be going over and we didn't go over. We went Broadway. I see. I'll take care of it. That was Jimmy Crockett because Dusty was on the road. So that night we go in the locker room. I've got the fucking hot dogs from the goddamn concession stand because we haven't eaten fucking dinner. And I'm fucking sitting down with my drink and my hot dogs, and Slater comes in and says, I need to see you, Cornette. I said, oh, fuck. Can I finish my hot dogs? I don't think you're going to want to. Okay. I go in the room and, uh, you know, closed up with Slater. I figure, okay, he knocked out John Matuzik, so he can't really fucking fight me or else it'll make him look bad. So uh, you made a phone call to the office. I said, Dick. We were told we were brought in here. We were supposed to go over every night, regardless of who or what, and we didn't. So we wanted to know if we'd been given wrong information or by who. And he said, well, they got a date book next month, but I, you know, they, they don't tell me what they're, they're going to come back with. And I don't know how to figure these finish. It was like if he was going to figure a different finish, but he didn't know what they were coming back with. They're coming back without you is what they were coming back with. And he knew that, right? <laughs> So I said, well, I said, no, no, you know, not trying to stir anything up. Just want to make sure we're doing the right thing. He said, well, come to me if you have any questions, which I never had any questions for the next week. He was still there. But anyway, that was, the, no, we didn't second guess anything because he told us from the start, we're going to put you here for six months and then get you over on the TV and then feed you in with the rock and roll. And actually, I liked that period of time. We were there in Atlanta for three months. And I liked it because we were home a lot. We had to go on those shitty tours to Ohio and West Virginia. But you go to fucking Columbus on Saturday night and you're it's, it's 90 miles. You're back by 1130. By midnight, I had a pizza, a big fucking gallon soft drink and Joe Petticino's Superstars of Wrestling tape to watch for the next six hours. Almost every Sunday was off except for Marietta. And, uh, you know, Macon was... 70 miles augusta was 150 miles so we were there for three months and then they just closed the whole thing down and brought us to atlanta or brought us to to charlotte so it, it was a nice little you know intermission there but we weren't worried and then it, we, like like is in this email they had already brought us up by august for the syndicated tv i think we made our first date at the charlotte coliseum in september or october off the top of my head and once we got there, Dennis had obviously, you know, early in his career, he had refereed in the Carolinas and he knew what a fucking huge territory, what a big money territory it was. He'd always wanted to go there as a top guy. So all the way up there, he's going, well, you see this place. We walked into Charlotte Coliseum, that 12,000 seats, that round fucking building. And then we see, because we'd been told the territory was on its ass. And the house that night in Charlotte was $60,000. That was a little over 6,000 people. And I looked out and I, 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 I can't even, it may have been Tully. I was standing there and I said, I thought the territory was on its ass. He said, it is. Cause that was half a house within six months. We were selling the fucking thing out. So I, you know, and I heard how those people reacted and we had an underneath match with a couple of underneath guys and got a good win, but I heard the way the people reacted. I, just, I saw the way they reacted to the matches all night. I said, okay, if this is the real Charlotte territory, we've made the right decision. They're into it. They're ready to go, and they need something different they want to fucking see. And that's what we did, and, and then it was beautiful. But anyway, continue on with Mike's uh, or any follow-up of your own. Well, I was going to say, how long after Crockett made the deal with Ole did they push out Thunderbolt Patterson? Because Almost immediately. <laughs> Ole had been using Thunderbolt, and him and Thunderbolt were like a baby-faced tag team. Yeah. And then as soon as the Crockett deal went down, Ole and I think Gene, who was well past his, you know, when he should yeah. be on TV at that point, turn on Thunderbolt, and then Thunderbolt is just gone. Yeah, well... It 
Thunderbolt kept only booked Thunderbolt, only liked Thunderbolt at some level. He also realized that of all the money that Thunderbolt had drawn in the entire business in his career, probably 70% of it was in the state of Georgia. That's the one place that you could still get something out of Thunderbolt Patterson at that time because his his work always sucked. I saw him in the 70s, and it was a shits. But his promos and just his personality, especially with the black audience, got over like a million dollars. So you worked around it, right? But by that point, the work was worse, and he wasn't drawing either. And the promos were had, had you know, he only booked him because he liked him and because of his history, but also the way Thunderbolt Patterson got booked in Georgia for the last 10 years of his career was he would come to whoever was running it and threaten to go to the newspapers, talk about racial discrimination, expose the business, uh, the whole of, uh, uh, what was the football player's name? The goddamn goofy football player. Help me. I've gone blank. Jim Wilson. Jim Wilson. Jim Wilson. He and Jim Wilson were always together. They'll go to, and Thunderbolt had buddied up and knew all of the civic leaders and the the uh, civil rights people in town. We'll cause trouble if you don't fucking book us. Th- that's flat out the offer that was made. And so the, he kept getting jobs at intermittent times in Georgia, and that was the last one. But Crockett wasn't going to put up with it, and he didn't want him to begin with. So that's where Thunderbolt went. Hey, real quick, because I've mentioned this to you, but I don't know if you've ever actually heard it. I'm going to play you a quick promo. It's not long. This is from 1990. Ole Anderson takes over as the booker, and his first moves are to bring back Junkyard Dog, gets Paul Orndorff in, which I guess was to replace Kerry Von Erich, who decided not to come in, Mr. Wrestling 2 back on TV to be a special referee, and Thunderbolt, for the first time in five years, is on TBS Wrestling. This is a promo he did. This is Thunderbolt Patterson. Amazing intensity. You look at him, you're like, wow, this guy's saying something, but he says nothing. He says nothing. Listen to this and tell me what you think. This is from 1990. Okay. gave me the opportunity again to keep my eyeballs on the old lady. You have ruined folks' lives. Not talking about how you dealt with mine in the past, but in the recently. You have been getting on everybody's case. So this Sunday... If you move, if you move, if you move, I am going, if you move, this Sunday, it's time to, ooh, I'm so full, I'm full up there here. Same old, but they say it's going to be a change. There will be a change. History has already been made. Call somebody. Tell somebody. Only if you move. Just move. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so again, he says nothing. But yeah, and, and part, you had to look at him and look at his eyes. And you had to see him saying it. And when he was jacked up, when he was fucking built in the in the 70s, when he, you know. It was it was something, and and he he didn't talk like a wrestler. He talked like a a preacher in a black church, and it was and that's why when he went with um with Ann Gunkel, that's one of the th- Thunderbolts. One of the things that kept her around as long as she was around, because that was a big deal in Georgia to have Thunderbolt Patterson in the early seventies. But there, there was one famous story they they used to tell long after he'd left the territory back in the the seventies TBS days. They would, they were doing the TBS show, and you know how? Remember at the end of the TBS show on Saturday nights, the last two minutes would be an interview segment where they would can fill up whatever time they had left, and they'd have the like the group of baby faces out there or the group of heels yeah. or whatever, and they'd plug the. And they were running Carrollton that night. Carrollton, Georgia, was a spot show on Saturday nights. And Ole told Thunderbolt, said, just go out. And every time we mention Carrollton, it does better. If we don't mention it, nobody comes. But if we just mention we're going to be in Carrollton, you know, then then it, the house is up. And a lot of times you would just hear one of the guys come out and say at the end of the show, and tonight we're being Carrollton, 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 right? The hogs are coming to Carrollton. So they tell Thunderbolt, go out and plug, just plug Carrollton, just 
plug Carrollton. And he's got like 45 seconds. And Soli gives the mic to him and puts the mic in front of him. And Thunderbutt, he does that thing where he, he wipes his face with his hand and comes over his face and he gets the expression. And then he clenches his fist in front of himself and he takes that deep breath. And then he lets it out. <laughs> and then he look of anguish comes on his face. And he says, oh, if I only had time. And they go <laughs> off the air. <laughs> All he had to say was, tonight I'm going to be in Carrollton. But no, he did his shit for 30 seconds and then said, if I only had time. In that, if you move promo, he says one of his, I guess the lines that people remember from Thunderbolt is, I'm full. I'm full up to here. Yeah. Didn't only I'm one full say, of it. Can't take no more. Yeah, what are you full of? <laughs> it, well, see, that's the thing is, at that point, Thunderbolt was still talking to all the people he'd been talking to for 20 years, and they knew. But for the people now on TBS that's seeing him in fucking Montana, they're like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Because they didn't know. It all made sense to people who had seen Thunderbolt. He a full up to here. And going to be a change come. Because I'm full. Can't you tell him I'm full? I've had it. It's funny. We talk about 1990 and Thunderbolt. And I'll get back to Mike's question after this. But on the most recent episode of John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, Steve Beverly's on the show. Uh, Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now, I should say, where we review the original broadcast of Pro Wrestling Spotlight. And they're talking about Thunderbolt being back on TBS all of a sudden. And Steve Beverly just laughs. He goes, you know, I kind of think it's amazing. You would see Thunderbolt at all these things like the Democratic conventions handing out flyers that Ted Turner's a racist because yeah. <laughs> he won't use them. And now all of a sudden he's back on TV <laughs> as soon as they bring it back. But here's uh, from Mike's uh, email here. You worked with the only other babyface tag team in the state of Georgia at the time, Pistol Pez Watley and the Italian Stallion. <laughs> what were those matches typically like? Pez was a legit college wrestler who had a high motor and several years of experience at the time. But what about Gary Cortinelli, who they seemed to have some hope for at the time? Obviously, he didn't pan out at a higher level, but did you see any glimmers of said hope? Were you expected to go 20 minutes every night, or could you pretty much do what you wanted? And I have to well, say, as soon as you mention Italian Stallion, I think about that may have been the December clash in 88. It was like almost 20 minutes, him and Dr. Death. <laughs> and it was just dreadful, just awful. Well, see, that's the thing. We did go 20 minutes every night because, and we wanted to. Uh, it wasn't like they expected us and were making us, especially when we were the main events on some of those small town cards. Um, you know, we want to give the people their, their money's worth. And it wasn't hard at all. We're not talking television. We're talking house shows where the heels are calling the thing. Uh, Pez did have a, we knew Pez from Tennessee. Pez was, um, heck of an amateur at the university of Chattanooga. Nick Goulas had broke him in. He knew Bobby and Dennis from ages. Um, and you know, I had, had seen him and, and then after I got into business had worked with him a couple of times, but you know, Pez was good. And this was before the Shaska Watley thing. He was a heck of a baby face and Pez could sell. And, the stallion at the time, Gary Cortinelli is his Italian stallion real name. Um, stallion was like 250, strong as a bull. He had been an amateur on a regional level. Um, we used to joke he had the world's largest head. You couldn't get a headlock on the Italian stallion. You couldn't reach around his goddamn giant fucking bulbous head. But he could do shit. You can you can watch the old TBS Saturday night shows and see that he today you would probably Italian stallion would get used in a main event spot. If he was around today, um, he j he couldn't cut a promo and it just, he was still green at that point in time, but it was no problem for Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry to have a 20 minute spot show match with those guys and people be fucking screaming. And it, it was easy. They weren't stiff or hard or whatever or didn't have bad attitudes. So that was not a problem at all. It was actually easier having those matches than it was working with the fucking Sawyers and the people saw the Sawyers as main event guys at the time. But Stallion, <laughs> Stallion's primary uh, uh, spot in Crockett Promotions from like 85 to 87 was as handsome Jimmy Valiant's chauffeur. 
because Jimmy wasn't going to drive anywhere. Jimmy, when we would run Rock Hill, South Carolina, 13 miles from my apartment, you would we would pass by the convenience store and see Jimmy Valiant's car five miles from his apartment sitting in the parking lot because he would have met Stallion and Stallion would have driven him the other eight miles. Um, Why but, is you that? Know, <laughs> because Jimmy wouldn't go to fucking drive. I, he had that disease where every time his feet hit the fucking carpet of the car, he went to sleep. So it it was a rib that he would actually, he'd get a ride from one side of his apartment complex to the other almost. And then also Jimmy and Stal, they knew when they went to the spot shows in the Carolinas down the state roads, they knew the the places in those little towns to stop by trial and error where the people that ran the markets and the groceries and, and things were big fans and they'd stop and come out with bag full of free groceries on the way to the goddamn shows. We'd take the interstate and just buy them ourselves. Hey, uh, one, but anyway. fi- one final part of this email here. On August 17th to August 23rd, a Northern Georgia tour was scheduled, including two dates planned for Indianapolis and Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay, that, that's written uh, in an old, unwieldy fashion. Georgia had Northern tours, they called them, which were in Ohio and West Virginia and Michigan, etc. So it wasn't a tour of North Georgia. It was a Georgia Northern tour. Go ahead. After two shows in Columbus and Cleveland, the tour was abruptly canceled. You noted in your book the cancellation gave the team an unplanned yet much-needed vacation. Do you remember why the tour was 86th? (laughs) Mike presumes bad sales. And more than that, do you have a theory on why they even decided to book those cities since Georgia's business wasn't doing great? And I don't believe either Oli or Crockett had ever followed their television there before. Any idea if they reached out to the Bruiser in the same way they were working with Jerry Jarrett or Ron Fuller to run joint shows inside their territories? Or is it possible because of geography that Jarrett was the one who gave them the green light to run? Uh, None of those things. Um, No, they didn't reach out to Bruiser because at that time, I think Bruiser may have moved to fucking Florida by that point. He was still uh, running. He was still running shows. Was he still running shows? Okay, well then, then he wouldn't have helped him if he was still running shows. Um, Scott Steiner debuted with him a couple of years after that. That's right. That's right. He wasn't. He wasn't still working on most of the shows, but they were still running. And then he moved to what was it? Eighty eight ish. He moved to Florida. Anyway, um, they didn't reach out to Bruiser. Um, they didn't reach out to Jerry Jarrett. He wouldn't have anything to do with Indiana. It's basically as simple as. You don't book these buildings four weeks in advance. In the middle of August, the buildings were probably, let's see, July, June, May, April. I mean, if they were doing anything approaching proper business, um, those buildings were booked in April or May when they were assuming that they were still going to be doing these things. And they probably were trying Indianapolis and Fort Wayne just to try something else up there because they were running the towns that they had been running to death. Um so, no, there it, it was probably just as simple as, and Ronnie West, uh, I think, was working in the office down there, and he probably wanted to reach out to another couple of towns. Um, so there wasn't anything to do with, with Bruiser or Jerry Jarrett, and the tour was 86 because, of yeah, it was fucking dying, and they, I think they had made the decision in Charlotte, let's just not do this anymore. Every time that I worked... <laughs> Every time that I worked based out of Georgia, the I never got fired. The entire territory was closed down. In 83, Oli came in to promos that day and said, let's don't do this anymore. We said, what? He said, any of it. And then three years or five, two years later, in 85, they closed it down again while I was there. And they just said by the end of, by October 1st, we were in, um, in Charlotte. So, I started looking for an apartment up there at first of September. So they had, yeah, August 17 through 23, they canceled this tour. Then they told the talent, we're all going to Charlotte, October the 1st, be there. And that, cause here's another thing. While I was working in Atlanta, the one pain in the ass was I was having on Wednesdays, the last month or so that I was there to drive up to Charlotte to be there at nine o'clock on Wednesday morning and do the regular Charlotte promos that the guys in Atlanta didn't have to do. So if I'd get a day off on a Wednesday, I'd still have to fucking go to Charlotte and and do promos for six hours for free and a four hour drive each way. 
So that wasn't a lot of fun. But anyway, and then everything just merged together uh, on October 1st. And by, J- by January, we did the angle with the rock and roll. By February, we were in the ring with them on the house shows and did the biggest business run of our lives. So I was not at all unhappy. We, we, I could have done without renting that extra apartment for three months, but what the fuck? We had a little rest, right? Right. 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 Yeah. But Dusty saw 84 mid South and said, how do I get everybody? Yeah. <laughs> how do I get everybody in here, baby? Everybody. And, and that, and that's the thing, you know, it, it just, Atlanta, um, a lot of people assume that Atlanta had been a healthy territory right until Vince took the TV. And that's not true. Atlanta had been hurting for about a year, year and a half. That's how he was able to slip in there and, and, and get the Briscoes and other people to, to sell their stock because the, uh, one of the big things was when they closed the city auditorium, um, Oli's booking in the early eighties in Atlanta was a little off the charts over, you know, he was all over the place, but it, they still had such a great wrestling tradition. But when they had closed the city auditorium, which was what 79, 80 thereabouts, the only place they had to run was the Omni in the whole town. The city auditorium was where they could go weekly and then do one Omni show at the big building a month. But they couldn't go weekly at the Omni. They couldn't afford the rent, and you couldn't put that, you know, you couldn't fill it. So they were left with running the Omni every two or three weeks and doing bigger shows, which cost more and had to bring more guys in. And then business had started to go down anyway. And Barnett was disinterested. And that's how, when I heard when we first got there, um, that Ole had broke into uh Barnett's office while Barnett was in Hong Kong getting a new wardrobe made and looked at the books and got enough evidence that he was messing around with the money that he was only was able to go to the other stockholders in the company and say Barnett's fucking us Barnett's defense was that he put money in it all the time or found money to put in it when it was bad so he took some of the money out of it when it was good <laughs> but once they lost Barnett you know, Ole was great at just running the wrestling business, but he wasn't personal friends with the goddamn president. He didn't know all those people, and he uh, was not the darling of Ted Turner that got, you know, wrestling on his station and saved uh, the promotion and all that stuff in years before. So uh, Georgia 83-ish was rocky, and business was not great, and that's how Vince was able to take advantage. Well, plus there was plus resentment. a lot of people owned it. A lot of people owned a piece of Atlanta. Well, that's it, it. What, he could he couldn't get into the Carolinas because nobody owned it but the Crockets. He couldn't get into fucking Mid South because nobody owned it but Watts. He couldn't get into Dallas because the Von Erichs owned it. But because of that war ten years earlier, there had been so much split in ownership, and so many pieces were out there that he was able to take Georgia. And again, the sale from Watts to Ole happened behind the back of the Briscoes. And it was That's really right. yeah. Ole partnering up with Fred Ward and Ralph Freed that became like the, the power group. And they pushed Barnett out. You know, that wasn't like, hey, Jack and Jerry, we're going to push Barnett out. Are you okay with this? No, they just did it. <laughs> and that turned around and bit Ole because when Ole complained about the Briscoes selling the stock to Vince McMahon without him having knowledge of it, they said, well, that's the same thing that happened with Bill Watts in the stock. And he yeah. came back to bite him. And I mean, that's really the big thing. The decisions of Ole Anderson, like pushing Barnett out right into the arms of the McMahons when they need someone because they're going to be expanding their television portfolio. It was perfect timing, but the fact that it was Ole and Ole couldn't get along with the Briscoes. Ole couldn't get along with his other partners other than Fred Ward. And they weren't going to go to battle with him. And all the boys couldn't stand Fred Ward and Ralph Freed. They called him Rooster. Frank Morell one time said, Ralph Freed is not the kind of guy you want to beat up. He's the kind of guy you want to slap down and piss on in front of the boys. But anyway, the son-in-law promoter. The, the son-in-law promoter. How many times have we heard that phrase, the son-in-law promoter? 